It is my pleasure to greet you on this day and to welcome you to commencement marking Friends Seminary's 232nd year. It's hot today, but as hot as it is, about six years ago it was 97, so we should count ourselves lucky. Recognizing the importance of this moment, the first thing I would like to do is invite you to disable your cell phones and other devices that make noise. We gather today to celebrate the highly successful, humane, artistic, athletic, complex, scholarly class of 2018. Over the course of their time here, they have revealed themselves to be a determined group of young people, many with significant overlapping accomplishments in academics, arts, and athletics. The commencement of the class of 2018 today will leave our classrooms, our stages, our fields, and our, this meeting house empty. But as parents and educators, we know this is the cycle of things. It is right, and it is good, and it is happening. It is the beginning step in the orderly transition from childhood to adulthood. 19 of you I've known for almost three quarters of your lives, a fact of which I'm very proud. And you have had the responsibility of being the caretakers of the Quaker values that you started learning in kindergarten. Those of you who entered along the way have brought much to our stages, our athletic fields, and to our classrooms. And for that, we are grateful. Thank you all for what you've given us. Now, I would like to introduce the class as it grew through the years and built strength upon strength with the addition of each and every member until it reached the 72 graduates you see before you. Since kindergarten, 19 students have been with the school. Please stand up. There was one addition in first grade. There was one in fourth grade. And one more in fifth. A 
large group of 19 and sixth grade. Two and seventh. One brave soul in eighth grade. Twenty-five joined us for high school in the ninth grade. Two joined us in tenth grade. and capping it off, one in the 11th grade. This ceremony marks an important moment in the personal and educational journey of these young men and women. They now become, forever, part of the enduring history and legacy of Friends Seminary. From its founding in 1786, and from your first day of kindergarten, this moment has been anticipated. Both the school and the class of 2018 now move one step further into our futures. Separate but forever intertwined, we count on you to help us bring about a world that ought to be. Please be seated. Not me. <laughs> On behalf of the Friends Seminary Board of Trustees, we welcome you, the class of 2018, also now known as the 232nd graduating class of Friends Seminary, along with your friends and families to graduation. <laughs> we are privileged to share this moment with you. Graduation is the day we really look forward to as board members. It is a celebration which reminds us of why we serve and the culmination of a ton of work by your teachers, administrators, staff, families, and of course yourselves. I'd like to acknowledge my fellow board members who are here for this very special occasion. Stand up, wave. One more. A few days ago, I celebrated my 35th reunion here, a great day full of lively conversations and memories. My classmates ran the gamut from lifers, which back then were 14 years, to those having just spent a couple of years at Friends. And our experiences since leaving Friends Seminary were all very different. But two things united everyone. First, the impact that our time at Friends had in helping us grow into open-minded, kind, caring, and involved adults. And second, the true sense of connection, which we still feel towards one another after so many years. I hope and believe that this has not changed. Friends Seminary set of values fostered over 232 years and counting is now part of each of you, no matter what, what path you follow. Last year, we underwent and passed our 10-year accreditation review by NYSEIS, the New York State Association of Independent Schools. We passed our exams with flying colors. We've been working this year to incorporate the recommendations made by the visiting committee. I can't resist in reading one quote from their report which made me very proud. By encountering students during our Sunday tours, the committee student lunch, and in classrooms and hallways, the visiting committee experienced friendly, thoughtful, respectful, intelligent, engaged, collaborative young people in all divisions. In our lunch interview, student leaders affirmed what we encountered the Quaker values and the school's mission are alive in their service, academics, advisory, sports, theater, arts clubs, committees, meetings for worship, welcoming of new students, and by extension into the neighborhood. Although few students identified as Quaker, they use Quaker values and practices for decision making, and they are aware of what they have gained through this access, through this aspect of the school. That's a well-deserved and very moving portrait of you from some very experienced educators. 
and everything we have seen as a board makes us feel that they were astute in their observations. So again, our heartfelt welcome and congratulations to the 232nd graduating class of Friends Seminary, class of 2018. You are the reason we are here, and we couldn't be more proud of you. And now for some reflections, I'd like to hand it off to Benjamin Levine and Arya Singh. I'd like to teach you a little physics tonight. Um, if you affirmed me as a speaker, you knew this would happen. Um, and if you didn't affirm me, this was probably what you were afraid of. Um, but please, bear with me. Um, there's a concept in theoretical physics called relativity. Its basic idea is that two objects moving at different speeds see things in different ways. You've probably experienced something like this riding a local train when an express catches up to you in the tunnel. And there's that moment when you look out the window and both trains are going the same speed. So it feels like both trains are standing still. And then you make awkward eye contact with someone on the other train, but you're suddenly saved because the express pulls ahead. From your perspective, the express is accelerating. The rider on the express, though, sees that the local is decelerating. In physics, this all has crazy implications, including time slowing down and uh, things getting really short and also super heavy, but the whole concept is based on frames of reference. Someone in one frame of reference experiences a completely different reality from someone in another frame. The maddening, difficult, and fascinating part of all this is that there isn't a correct or universal frame that we can say is the definitive truth. The best we can do is to remember that there are these different realities and to base our calculations accordingly. You're probably wondering if I'm done with the nerd talk and the answer is yes, um, you can wake up now. <laughs> um, the reason I mention frames of reference is that people are so deeply divided today and these frames, these individual pockets of reality, are what keep us separated. Look at the red-blue divide in America, for instance. Look at the rabid Mets-Yankees split. Look at Friends Seminary. It's easy to box yourself into a single frame of mind, to impose your frame of reference on someone else's actions without remembering that they have a background or experience a completely different reality from yours. It's so much easier and simpler to decide someone is racist or ignorant or naive or anti-Semitic than to engage in the messy work of trying to communicate and understand when conflicts arise. Other people's truths are just as valid to them as ours are to us. Nobody is the villain in their own story. And without understanding and accepting that, we remain divided. It's difficult, complicated, and tiring, especially when those truths are at odds with our own. But to paraphrase writer and journalist H.L. Mencken, for every complex problem, there's an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. The world is full of complex problems, especially when it comes to people, relationships, and power. And whether we're dealing with international conflicts, discomfort in a classroom, or sibling squabbles, it's our responsibility to find nuanced, just solutions to them. History's shown time and time again that covering up issues or silencing voices doesn't work. The way to solve problems and change the world for the better is by understanding frames of reference. This is not to say you must accept every point of view. It's not to say that people aren't racist or sexist or bigoted, 
Rather, we must think openly and critically about all frames, taking into account the truths or lack thereof in each, and then making an informed decision about our own opinions and actions. It's impossible for any one point of view to encompass the full picture. And so by widening our horizons and empathizing, even with perspectives that we don't agree with, we become wiser and better. Some people say this graduating class of 2018 is difficult. But if there's one thing we've done really well, it's taking the Quaker values of community and dialogue to heart. We have the courage to speak our minds, and we truly try to listen to all sides. That's what sets us apart. We are difficult in the best possible way, and that makes me incredibly proud to be a member of this class. We are so talented and passionate. On these benches sit future pioneers in science, famous artists, successful entrepreneurs, and world leaders. But what is more important than all that is our willingness to look into different frames of reference. It's our drive to understand those foreign ideas and to constantly improve and grow, no matter how difficult and uncomfortable it may be. In the end, life isn't about who said what, or who was right, or which train wins the race through the tunnel. It's about making a difference for the better of all, making sure that everyone, regardless of background or belief or perspective, reaches the station, despite the MTA's best efforts to delay us. <laughs> Together, we can find more complete and lasting solutions. Together, we will make it there. And relativity will be the light that guides us through the tunnel. Thank you. seven years of my life in only a few minutes because it truly was every moment of every day that made my experience so special. When I came to Friends in the sixth grade, I had a very different view of myself, of society, and of the purpose of school than I do today. I had decided that school was solely a place to learn within a classroom. I knew I was very different from the people around me. In my life before friends, this difference had made it hard to connect with others. So I was cynical and expected that people wouldn't understand or attempt to understand me. I would be lucky if a few people talked to me. If I was really lucky, I would leave high school with one or two friends. And I was okay with that. Back then, that was my normal. I still vividly remember my first day at Friends. I was surprised to be met with such kindness and genuine excitement for students and faculty alike. I felt an intrinsic warmth. Students introduced themselves, and I didn't receive the inappropriate questions or stares that I was used to or expecting. I felt normal and just like any of the other anxious sixth graders starting their very first day of school. But I told myself, this will wear off. People are just being so nice to you because this is your first day. Well, I was happily wrong. Day after day, I kept receiving that same kindness. In the seventh grade, I was out of school for several weeks when I had surgery. I didn't think anyone would notice my absence. 
I was worried it would be difficult to reintegrate back into a community and reconnect with friends that I had made only a year ago. And yet again, friends proved me wrong as it does every single day. I received visits from teachers and classmates, a flood of handmade cards, and funny emails about school with lots of emojis. It was the seventh grade. The friends community showed me that I was valued. I will always be grateful for everyone who welcomed me back as if nothing had happened. The more time I spent at friends, the more I started to take the way we treat each other here for granted. I got used to people holding doors for me as I moved from class to class. I got used to getting emails and texts when I was out sick. And most importantly, I got used to being fully accepted. My hyper-awareness of being so different disappeared, and so did the stigma that I had put on myself. I started to see my differences as valuable. Before the sixth grade, I would have treated anything not to feel different. I wanted so badly to be like everyone else. But if you ask me now, I wouldn't trade my experiences, the painful, the challenging, and the good, for anything. Why? Because friends has taught me that it's our differences that make us more aware of the world in which we live. It really was the celebration of our differences and the collective everyday moments that made my experience invaluable. I know it's not normal for students to send me class notes when I'm sick and take the care to color code them to meet my neurotic behavior before I even ask and for teachers to spend hours helping me catch up on work when I'm at the hospital. I know it's not normal for my friends to move my desk for me before I even get to class, for friends to open my water bottle instinctively knowing it will be too tight, or for students to pick up something I dropped before I even noticed it fell. I know it's not normal for Jackie to make sure I was able to reach my plate during lunch, and for crossing guards to come in five minutes early every day to put the ramps in place for me. And finally, I know it's not normal for parents and classmates to make sure that I could participate in bar mitzvahs, parties, and pre-prom, even if this meant changing the location of their birthday party at a moment's notice when it wasn't actually accessible. But these are things that everyone at Friends worked so hard every single day to create and normalize in the world around us. Through these daily acts of thoughtfulness and consideration, the faculty and students modeled what it means to be genuinely loving, supportive, and accepting. The people at Friends are so instinctively generous and caring, not because they expect anything in return, but because they just feel it is right. However, the reality of the world beyond these four walls became crystal clear to me last summer. Because of the encouragement that I receive here, I wasn't scared to attend a summer pre-college program on a campus far from home. I naively thought it would be like my life at Friends. When I was there, though, I was met with judgment and resentment. Almost daily, I overheard comments made by my peers. I'll read you a few. Why is she here? Why does she think we're willing to wait for her if we're not even friends with her? Or, we don't want her in the photo, she's ruining it. I was shocked, I was mad, and I was confused. I had forgotten that people could treat others in such a cruel and unaccepting way. To be honest, for a split second, I was mad at friends. I thought it hadn't prepared me for the real world, but what I soon realized was that it did prepare me for a world that ought to be. Because of the value of integrity Friends has instilled in me, I know that the only way to grow is by leaning into discomfort. So I decided to be vulnerable by initiating an open discussion with my peers. I explained my life, my feelings, and my own experiences in an effort to create a sense of understanding. Afterwards, students told me that I fostered a sense of empathy and awareness within them. And when I heard those words, I knew I had my time at Friends to thank. I would like to think that I changed the 40 or so people in my dorm for the better. 
Even if, it was, even if it was only a small change, I know that it was because of friends. What I did last summer is a testament to friends and something I would have never even thought about doing seven years ago. I know we've probably rolled our eyes once or twice at Friends' mission. We prepare students to engage in the world that is and to help bring about a world that ought to be, but the mission could not be more accurate. Friends is a place of true compassion and models how the world should be. It should be a place without discrimination where we learn from each other's unique experiences and use them to connect with each other. I know that the students graduating today impact the world every day because they've impacted my world every day. Thank you to all of my teachers for making me feel completely accepted and able to thrive in your classes. There are many of you who will be in my heart forever, but here are just a few examples. I want to thank Stefan for not only helping me discover my love of history and realize it as a route for social change, but maybe even more importantly, for all of the time, comfort, encouragement, and invaluable guidance you gave me when I needed it the most. Thank you, Kate, for giving the best life advice, being my school mom, and for being a constant source of fashion inspiration. I want to thank Audrey for thinking about my needs before I knew them, believing in me, and graciously giving me so much of yourself. Thank you to my advisor, Mr. G, for all of the energy you gave me and for reminding me that it's okay to ask for help. And thank you to Bo for always making me feel so welcome here. You were literally the only principal in all of New York City who viewed a child in a wheelchair with acceptance and not apprehension. And without you, I'm not sure what I or my family would have done. Most of all, I want to thank my family. Thank you to my mom and dad for getting me to this point. Thank you for pushing me to do my best when I didn't think I could anymore, and for reminding me that everything will be okay, whether through song, quote, or bitmoji. Thank you for reminding me that doing my best is always enough, and for believing in me when it seemed that the world did not. Thank you for supporting me in my dreams and making me believe that I was limitless. Thank you to Kieran and Tara for being protectors, for reminding me to find the fun, to shake it off when the time calls for it, and to defend myself. And thank you to my grandfather for your stories of your childhood when I needed a study break, and most of all, for showing me the definition of perseverance. As we leave today, I want to thank my class for inspiring me on a daily basis and for continually showing me just how far simple acts of compassion can go. If everyone continues to treat the people around them the way that you have to me, everyone here will change lives. And I know that because that's what everyone here has done for me. I've learned more from you about kindness, acceptance, thoughtfulness, and openness than I could have learned anywhere else. As we all embark on new adventures filled with new people, and new experiences, I hope we can remember the impact we have had on each other and take what we've learned here to legitimately bring about a world that ought to be. Thank you.
It is the truth universally acknowledged, rooted in the heart of the Fast community, the contentment far beyond that Denman Tuzum is a good man. Long after he was introduced to the 15th Street meeting by his father and, att and attended a memorial service in this very room, Denman took what he thought would be a temporary desk job and transformed it into a colorful career of 19 years and counting. In fact, the term desk job is a misnomer. Many of the times I pass by Denman's desk, he's off tending to various responsibilities, all the while burning a remarkable amount of calories as he runs back and forth between the annex and the main building. I first had the pleasure of working with Denman through the literary magazine, where I had to do a double take after realizing he was the faculty advisor and had been for 10 years. Unsurprisingly, Denman went above and beyond creating in-depth timelines with publication, announcement, and submission dates, calling his friend at the printing company, and sending out encouraging words after every semi-desperate call for submissions email is sent out. Truly acting as the glue of the Friends community, Denman selflessly draws from all his faculties, combining them with his own passion, all in the name of helping others because anything else simply wouldn't feel right. Having majored in English literature at Harvard, he's the best lit mag faculty advisor one could ask for, and even taught a creative writing elective on short stories and poetry. As a former basketball player and overall fan of the game, just trying his best to root for the Knicks, Denman coached J.B. Boyd's basketball. Denman has even been a student advisor in the past and is currently a student identity group facilitator, driving to support students of color in need of role models. Going into college, he was set on majoring in psychology because he knew he was a good listener and wanted to help people in that way. But instead of talking with patients or doing research, he's putting smiles on the faces of countless teachers, students, administrators, and faculty just by waving hello to them. Equipped with the brightest smile and the heartiest laugh, he has the answer to many questions and just might look the other way if you're late and lucky. His presence alone in his usual corner in the back of the meeting house is enough of an omen that the day will be a good one. And if he's not there, well, we're all doomed. <laughs> he says, I hope you feel better when your parents call to tell him you're at home sick. And he's what makes friends, friends. Please join me in welcoming Dan Mentuzo. eye perceives a man standing humbly before you who remains relatively youthful in both constitution and demeanor. The calendar's eye, however, has its gaze fixed upon an opposing narrative, which counts said man amongst those listed on the old guard's roster. In fact, according to local legend, I graduated from Friends prior to the error of gainful employment. <laughs> Ever a fan of legend, I decided to do a little research. As it turns out, I did not graduate from Friends. <laughs> Instead, I matriculated at Regis, a Jesuit high school for Roman Catholic boys on the Upper East Side. Fun fact, both John Garnavicus and Tom O'Connell did as well. 
There I had the great fortune of being taught by Mr. John Connolly. Unlike one certain misguided legend, Mr. Connolly actually did graduate from Regis before serving as a member of its faculty for 52 years. Each occasion that I have to sit in this meeting house for these very commencement exercises, I am reminded of something that Mr. Connolly offered to my parents prior to my own graduation. He said, what I appreciate the most about Denman is that he is childlike. <laughs> After what I can only imagine must have been a somewhat confused and skeptical look from my parents, he continued, mind you, I did not say childish. I said childlike. And I sincerely hope that never changes. So, what then is childlike? At the time, Mr. Connolly was presumably referring to a sustained sense of wonder and its virtue. In order to verify this claim, one could certainly point to my wondering how it is in the four decades I have walked this temporal realm that the Knicks have never won a championship. But in all seriousness, let us deepen this investigation by recalling details from my own childhood. My mother tells me that shortly after I was born, my father took to calling me his little rabbi, his little priest. I say my mother tells me this because my father is generally suspicious of history. He's been known to dismiss many an account with a simple, well, I wasn't there. In any event, as a young man, my father had attended biblical college and been ordained a minister. He never practiced, though. He became a contractor instead, utilizing the trades that his grandfather had taught him. His terms of endearment then were undoubtedly part of a ritual that allowed him to live out his previous calling. I say all of that in the hopes of illuminating an episode I'm about to share. I was about three years old. Having finished my dinner, I asked to be excused from the table. Unbeknownst to my parents, I had a project to complete. I can remember going down the stairs to the basement, into my father's workspace, looking for suitable pieces of wood. I intended to build an airplane. I beamed with pride having but glued two pieces together. It seemed an appropriate juncture to display my toy-making prowess, so I went back to my parents with the unfinished work in hand. Before I could even get the words out, I remember my father saying, Kathy, do you see what the boy has there? My mother responded, yes, Chesterfield, I see it. It was as if I, too, could hear the angelic hosts on high proclaiming that scripture had been fulfilled. They thought my airplane was a cross. <laughs> I didn't have the heart to tell them otherwise. So a cross it was. And there it remained on a wall by the basement staircase. Although one could easily relegate this to an instance in which a child did not want to disappoint his parents, upon reflection, I suspect that something further happened. The symbolism here was bigger than me, bigger than my parents, and that mystery was not lost upon a developing mind. My love for my parents allowed me to embrace a transforming moment of possibility. It wasn't simply about me. Another way of speaking to this may have been encapsulated during a recent visit to Tibet House, a nearby cultural center founded at the request of the Dalai Lama. One of the meditations that evening focused on sound and deep listening techniques. Chimes, distortion, running water, and even passing cars from the street outside were all prospective paths towards stillness and a genuine acknowledgement of the presence worth. 
At some point during the course of this meditation, one of the teachers gently suggested that we listen not with our ears, but with our hearts. I think that was, to a certain extent, the end result of this moment of misunderstanding with my parents. And I would argue that this is also closer to the essence of what was not only my high school teacher's compliment, but his challenge. I am a born and raised New Yorker, a native Manhattanite. In other words, I'm on the endangered species list. <laughs> All rarity and kidding aside, in my estimation, one of the many privileges that come with living in this city is access to an abundance of sacred spaces, this meeting house not being the least among them. Well, it suddenly occurred to me on a Sunday morning last month that I had not yet seen the Riverside Church. So my significant other and I decided to gather there with the congregation for worship. I was utterly taken with the beauty of the architecture, the stained glass work, the music, and the sermon by one Reverend Michael Livingston. Reverend Livingston told the tale of two little children a brother and a sister that went viral almost 20 years ago. The sister was suffering from a rare and fatal disease that left her in desperate need of a blood transfusion. Her brother was the only viable candidate, given that he had the necessary antibodies, having somehow survived the disease himself. Before simply moving ahead with the procedure, of course, the brother was asked first if he was willing. Taking the matter quite seriously, he reflected on it overnight before making his decision. He ultimately agreed, and all parties involved rushed to ensure that the sister would get her brother's donation in time. As he was lying next to his sister in the hospital, the brother turned to the attending doctor and asked, how long do I have before I die? The boy bravely consented out of love for the sake of his sister. Now, it doesn't matter that all of this actually came from the 1993 bestseller, Chicken Soup for the Soul, <laughs> a collection of inspirational stories that a couple of motivational speakers compiled from interactions with their audience members. What matters is the telling of how this boy loved. The manner was strong, trusting, unconditional, and open. It seems to me, my friends, that the ability to love is childlike. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. himself touched upon something similar 51 years earlier at Riverside, a year to the day before he was assassinated, as he spoke out against the evils of the Vietnam War. There, Brother Martin said, this call for a worldwide fellowship that lifts neighborly concern beyond one's tribe, race, class, and nation is in reality a call for an all-embracing and unconditional love for all men. This oft misunderstood and misinterpreted concept so readily dismissed by the Nietzsche's of the world as a weak and cowardly force has now become an absolute necessity for the survival of man. When I speak of love, I am not speaking of some sentimental and weak response. I am speaking of that force which all of the great religions have seen as the supreme unifying principle of life. Love is somehow the key that unlocks the door which leads to ultimate reality. He was not speaking of some sentimental and weak response. He was speaking of an uncompromising resolve. You don't have to think about it, and you most certainly don't have to like it. He was asserting the powerful reality of what it is to love, even one's enemy. Malcolm X supported this notion in his answer to a student question 
at the Harvard Law School Forum in December of 1964. There, Brother Malcolm said, and then we should not take sides either way. We should reserve political action for the situation at hand, in no way identifying with either political party, the Democrats or the Republicans, or selling ourselves to either party. We should take political action for the good of human beings. That will eliminate the injustices. Love is the creative force that propels us past the divisiveness of fear, self-interest, and ideology towards transforming moments of possibility. It necessarily concerns us with the welfare of others, and it works tirelessly against the injustices that surround, of which there are many. It has been a difficult time for our community, for our country, for the world. I am not here to name ills, but I am here to assure you bright citizens of tomorrow, class of 2018, that you are poised to confront them. Walk forth from these benches, committed to keeping a sustained sense of wonder and actively listening an otherwise open heart a loving resolve, inner peace, and a beginner's mind. Do not allow said ills to advance you beyond your years, excusing you from your obligation to love. Claim your birthright. Be childlike. Denman and the class that selected you for speaking to us tonight. What a beautiful way you have given me, Elizabeth Enlow, as the co-clerk of the board, the opportunity to introduce meeting for worship as until you and soon to be graduates. The religious is thank you for your beautiful message of love. Thank you. The Religious Society of Friends, Quakers, believe that there is in each of us a measure of the divine, or the inner light, or perhaps, as Denman said, the capacity for true and enduring love. Friends' manner of worship, or a Quaker meeting, is conducted in silence, a waiting silence, a silence that makes possible a deep calm, a profound listening, the possibility of a revelation we might not otherwise have had without that silence. Among the many gifts of Friends Seminary's education is the rare, rare gift of entering into a welcoming silence, unafraid. Knowledge, love, and understanding require waiting and listening. And these are among the many, many skills you as graduates take into the world. After we hear and enjoy the readings of Sophia and Navid, you, we, all of us are invited into silence. Lest this feel strange and awkward to some of us, please be not afraid. Know that any one of us may speak out of the silence. Pause and hear those who have spoken. Those of us who speak and those of us who don't speak in a meeting for worship equally contribute to its beauty. And at the right time, we will end our period of silence with a handshake. I think uh, Navid and Sophia, welcome.
um, excerpt from Letters to a Young Poet by Rainer, Rainer Mary Rilke. Be patient toward all that is unresolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves, like locked rooms and like books that are now written in a very foreign tongue. Do not now seek the answers which cannot be given to you because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing it, live along some distant day into the answer. Invictus by William Ernest Henley. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever God may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me in afraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Thank you, everyone. Um, I have to say that tonight's words were some of the most powerful that I've ever heard spoken in this meeting house. And you leave us with a lot to think about. So thank you. Now, on behalf of the Board of Trustees of Friends Seminary, a New York State Educational Corporation, and as approved by the faculty and administration, it is with pleasure and affection and admiration that I present diplomas to members of the class of 2018. Will the first row please rise? <laughs> Tiffany Marie Aguilar. <laughs> Rupert Dean Andrew. Lucas Anderson Ansel. Phineas Benjamin Berry. <laughs> Alexander Hena Benjamin. <laughs> Nick.
Nyla Ashe Bent. Evan Lawrence Balotsky. Sebastian Cole Christensen Borden. Jamie Hartstein Brunstad. Sigourney Van Nostren Buell. Will the first row please sit down and will the second row please rise? <laughs> Mariah Agnihotri Burka. <laughs> Archer Mather Carr Angler. William David Cohen. <laughs> Fuad Dakwar. <laughs> Sabrina Debler. Camillo Lewis Durr. <laughs> Edward John Felsenthal. <laughs> Jack Henry Fessenden. Beatrice Finlay. <laughs> Ella Joy Fuchsberg. <laughs> Nicole Galliotto. Sophia Gallo. <laughs> Josephine Llewellyn Durand. <laughs> Alexander Ross Hadley. The second row may be seated. Will the third row please rise? <laughs> Eamon Severio Hauser. Morgan Rose Healy. <laughs> Hudson Hart Hooten.
Sierra Bliss Hubbard Salt. Dwight Anthony Huey Jr. Ladeja Maria Jackson Antrim. Samuel Philip Williams Jakovitz. Bailey Sarah Senlu Jones. Chloe Aronette Kellner. Jack David Manning Cranes. Alan Kwan. Abraham Roscoe Levin. Benjamin Jing Su Lin Levin. Juliet Ray Lilly. <laughs> row three may be seated. Will the fourth row please rise? <laughs> Patrick Collins Litke. Simon Mayo Lowe. <laughs> Kiara Niambe Jendai Malin. Navid Mamoun. <laughs> Messiah Malachi McCall. <laughs> Liliana Tiger McInerney. August Kenan Guilfoyle Moody. <laughs> Sophia Isabel Nardi Bart. Elena Katie Nadal. <laughs> Nidin Nishant. <laughs> Max 
Alexander Nitke. Christian Lee Knoll. Evan J. Oberstein. <laughs> Stefano Taiwan Opichi. <laughs> Richard Omar Randolph Payne. Will the fourth row be seated? Fifth row, please rise. Abraham Quito. Bless Kaya Reese. Bella Rose Reed. <laughs> Alessandra Catherine Rizzo. <laughs> Samuel Richard Kirkley Rockwell. Justin Paul Rubino. Christopher Martin Sherlock. Aria Channing Singh. Issa Scabelli. <laughs> Bookie Schwartz. <laughs> Maya Claire Van Loon. Jackson Lloyd Wald. <laughs> Natalie Chang Gray White. <laughs> Maeve Elizabeth Mater Woolen. Carly Noble Wooten. And Matteo Antonio Zules.
Fifth row, if <laughs> you may be seated. <laughs> we'll now stand and sing the school's alma mater. Please note that the graduates, now alumni, will sing the second verse with any other alums who are present, and we will join them for the chorus. Please stand. Thank you.